Greetings. This is Minister Michael Muhammad coming to you on behalf of Torchlight Interfaith Ministries with another message of spiritual enlightenment, spiritual upliftment, and God willing, aiding you to come closer to the knowledge of God, the knowledge of yourself in God, and what God would have you to do with this knowledge. I begin in a interfaith way in the name of the one God, the great grand architect of the heavens and the earth, the originator of all that was, is, and will be, the father, nurturer, sustainer of all life, the controller of life and death, the God who is called by many, many, many names. In the Far East or in the faith of Buddha, Buddhism, the Buddhists have 38 names that represent manifestations of God. The ancient Egyptians had 29 names or words or titles used to refer to the one God. The ancient Hebrews uh, who are frequently today represented in Judaism have 72 sacred names for God. Uh, as Christians, we have come to elevate out of all of the words or names in the Bible for Almighty God, we've come to elevate as Christians the name of Jesus above all other names to represent the presence of God. As Muslims, Muslims, we have been given 99 attributes or names of God but Muslims call on God by his formal and proper name that represents all the other 99, Allah. But by whatever name we call the creator, God Almighty, we must understand that God is one. And just as he has many languages that he has blessed humanity to be able to speak in different parts of the world. We don't understand all of the many thousands of languages. We cannot be confused by different names for God than what we have come to know by the teaching of others. We thank Almighty God for all of his manifestations, all of his sages, his prophets, his messengers that have reminded us, called us back to the remembrance of God. But we must come to know in this day and time that Almighty God has saved the hardest job of any of the messengers, prophets, and warners for a people who represent a problem that has never existed on the planet, a problem that the old prophets and messengers, some of them saw, some of them knew about, but none of them are present here today of old to offer their solution to the problem, and that problem exists right here in North America, of course, I'm talking about the condition, the quandary, the, 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 uh, the, the phenomenon, if you will, the, the paradox, if you will, of black people in America, of people who are spiritual by nature, but have been stripped of the full power of that spirituality, a people who have been taught, nurtured, and groomed in the ways of Satan. 
And so God is interested today in us hearing voice that will call us out of the way of Satan and come into the full knowledge of God, the knowledge of ourself. And I am of the understanding and opinion and belief that God has raised these voices step by step for black people in America. Going back to the great noble Drew Ali, going back to the great social political voice of the Honorable Marcus Garvey, going back to the powerful teaching of men like Daddy Grace, uh, men like Father Divine, uh, and of course, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and now today, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I greet you in the name of all of these great preachers and teachers who have tried to lift us up with the greeting words of peace. Peace be unto you. Today I want to uh, talk to you in this month of October with a message that has pressed upon me to share. And that message in October is relevant in the fact that October is a month of transition. We're in a great month of transition. We're in a time period in the change of seasons where the fruit of the ground and the earth is being harvested uh, in certain hemispheres of the world. We're in a time and period uh, where in the north the leaves are falling off of the trees but in the south the southern hemisphere things are springing forward in parts of the southern hemisphere and so October is a unique period in the cycle of our planet it is the 10th month that represents transition. And so here we are 10 months into 2020 and America is still in the throes of a divine plague, the coronavirus, COVID-19, that has taken hundreds of thousands of lives and infect infected Many more thousands of people has caused much financial loss and material loss and suffering of families and people under the weight of what God has permitted to strike America in a way that is much more intense than any other nation on America's level. America is wrestling with this plague as we speak. And so I wanted to talk to you on a message I call Job's wife. Job's wife. And as students of scripture, we are all familiar with this man, Job. And we, we all have some acquaintance with the sufferings of Job. A man with much abundance, much wealth, many blessings, and God tried that man. And in a real sense, America is blessed like Job. America has tremendous wealth, tremendous power, tremendous prestige, abundance in America like no other nation. And so what happens when America is under trial by God or judgment by Almighty God? And her wealth, her power, her prestige, her abundance begins to be diminished by a force that her best scholars, scientists, 
and whatnot are not able to understand. Many of us who preach the word of God and teach the word of God and study the word of God, we really don't understand what is going on in America. Because, of course, we have a hard time distinguishing between Satan's world, the reality of Satan's world, the matrix of Satan's world versus God's world. So do you believe that God is able to straighten America? Do you believe that God is real, that he lives, that he's able to raise voices? Do you believe that God has a voice in America? Do you believe that God has the ability to reach down and into America and, and correct America, to chasten America, to judge America? How can we not believe these things if we are a Christian, if we are a Muslim, if we are practicing uh, the faith and teachings of Moses, if we are practicing the faith and teachings of Buddha, if we are following our great bishops, our great pastors who have preached and taught the word to us, how can we not look to see how God is present in the United States of America in 2020? Job's wife. But before I get to that, I want to talk about this thing because a lot of us belong to families that have been blessed. A lot of us belong to organizations and groups and institutions that have been blessed. A lot of us have been blessed and, and blessing uh, 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 makes us become so arrogant, so uh, uh, this feeling of entitlement, this feeling of being special, this feeling of being a, a little better than, than, than everybody else because God has blessed me with so much abundance. Or maybe he's blessed me with so much gift or talent or intelligence or, or a position where I have influence over others he, I, I'm, I'm blessed because I, I'm better than everybody else. Are you blessed? And we all, if you can watch this message or listen to this message, no matter what state or condition you're in, we've got to count ourselves as blessed because we're still above ground. We're still breathing. We still have one more minute, one more second, one more hour to try to serve Almighty God in the will and purpose for which he brought us on this planet. Are you blessed? Are you blessed? And what happens to us when you huh, begin to lose something that you have been blessed with, that you become comfortable with, that you're used to having, that you feel in title to have. Well, Job was a man of great abundance. The Bible says he was wealthier than any man in the East. Job obviously was a man who uh, sacrificed the fruit of his labor to make provision for his family, his loved ones, his community. Uh, unlike America and some of us, Job was called uh, perfect and upright. He, he was uh, one that feared God and shunned evil. Job was a man who in his abundance, he, he had seven sons and three daughters. The book says, the book says he had 7,000 sheep 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, and 500 she-asses. Job 
sons and daughters and family and everybody was able to find provision under the wing of Job. Job was a wealthy man, but he wasn't just wealthy. He was righteous because the book says he was upright and he feared God and shunned evil. Now, how many of us can say that? How many of us can say that, that we, we've, we've achieved what we've achieved by being upright? We've achieved what we have achieved by shunning the things that are considered evil, envy and jealousy and backbiting and backstabbing and plotting and maneuvering and sabotaging and undermining others to get what we want. How many of us can stand in the shoes of a man like Job and be blessed without the tarnish of evil and with great trembling and fear of Almighty God. So the Bible opens this story about Job counting down his wealth and his abundance, and it talks about Job's sons uh, and daughters engaging in the celebration of their abundance by having a feast. But in the midst of their feasting, Job, the man of God, he began to cry out to God on behalf of his children. This sounds like a man who is what they said he was because he appealed to God and said in his mind, I need to cry out to God on behalf of my children in case they have offended God and I don't know about it. So I'm going to go. I'm going to go to the altar. I'm going to go to the threshing floor. I, I'm going to go down on my knees and I'm going to cry out to God on behalf of my loved ones, just in case they've committed some evil that I don't know about. Now, a lot of us as parents, we're not prepared to accept that our children are capable of committing evil. Many of us as parents, we <clears throat> We, we are in complete denial that it's possible that our little Johnny, our, our little Susie, uh, is capable of committing evil. And, 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 and so sometimes uh, it is that trait we have as parents uh, that blinds us to the will of God. And in fact, sometimes it puts us at odds with the will of God because God will chasten our children. He will allow them to suffer the consequences of their evil. And if we are righteous parents, we can pray for them. But up to a point, we're going to have to get out of the way and allow God to do what he's going to do when it comes to our children. And so Job understood this. And so he was being preventive. He, he, he was practicing preventative medicine, if you will. He was crying out to God for his children. But you know, uh, as he's doing that, the Bible, as you know, talks about a meeting taking place <laughs> where the sons of God gathered themselves together before the Lord. But it says Satan came also among them. Wow. And it, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered God and said, God, I, I've been going up and down, to and fro in the earth. Some books say, seeking whom I could devour. And the Lord said, Satan, has thou considered my servant, Job, that there is none like him in the earth, and a perfect and upright man, one that feareth me and shuns evil. And Satan answered God and said, doth Job fear you for not? Thou hast put a hedge around this man, Job, and his house, 
and all that he hath on every side. And you, God, have blessed the work of his hands and the substance of his increase in the land. So you want me to consider a man that you're protecting. You, you, you want me to consider a man that you're protecting. Uh, this is a unique story, dear beloved, because here's a man righteous and upright. He's While he's crying out to God, there's a meeting taking place. And, and, uh, and so God gathers the sons, his sons, but Job is not invited to the meeting. Job ain't in the meeting. But Job is the man who evidently is on God's mind. Think over that. So here's a gathering. A gathering of powerful, righteous people, but the one who God is really interested in, somebody left him off of the, uh, of the meeting list. Somebody kept him outside, and so in the meeting, Satan is there, and God and Satan are engaged in this discussion about Job. And God wants Satan to try Job. And Satan challenges God and says, you want me to try him, but you got your arm around him. And I'm not strong enough, Satan talking. To break your arm when your arm is around a man, I can't try that man. I can't touch that man. So God, in words, I'm paraphrasing, uh, dear people, so, so, so just bear with me. Uh, God says, look, Satan, I, I'll remove my hedge. I will remove my hedge because I want you to try my man. I want you to see what a man is like who I have made unto myself. A man who is my image and is my likeness. A man, I want you to understand, Satan, that when I make a man, you will not break that man. Even when it looks like you broke that man, that man is not broken. That man may be humbled. That man may be tried. That man may be tested. And in the trial and the test and the humiliation, he may look like he's broken on the inside, but on the, uh, on the outside, but on the inside, you will not break my man. I hope you understand what I'm saying here. There's a great drama unfolding between God and Satan. So Satan says, I'm going to try him. And God says, go on, Satan, try him, but you can't have his life. Do whatever you want to do, but leave him, his person, alone. And so Satan goes to work. And so shortly after, <laughs> if we uh, the way it's arranged in the in the in the book of Job, it, it's like as soon as the meeting is over, Job gets up from prayer, and Job is going on with celebrating God and his family and the abundance of uh, his blessings. And here come messengers, one after the other. They come one after another announcing grim news to Job. And step by step, Job's wealth first is taken. His oxen, his camels, all of that that he had, this abundance of, of livestock. And if you know anything about the wealth that comes with livestock, not only back in earlier times in history, but today there has always been great wealth. Uh, uh, men who have had livestock have always accumulated a great wealth. They, 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 because the livestock has value because we eat and we wear and we drink the byproduct of these animals. And so one by one, 
here comes one messenger saying, "Look, we we they fell upon us and and they and they took they took the livestock." Here comes an, another another man uh, uh, saying, "Look, your sons, you know, uh, your sons died in an accident. They died in a catastrophe." And, and then finally, here comes the last messenger or last. A, a, a announcement that Job's health now is being afflicted. And I'm speeding through the narrative, uh, dear people, uh, because I don't want to make this a long message. I just want to share the essence of, of what I believe we should say right now. And so Job's health is afflicted. Satan now has hit him on three fronts. His wealth, his children, and his health. Now, how tormenting is that? Some of us have lost our wealth. Some of us have lost children or a child. Some of us struggle because our health is not what it should be. These are things that many of us can relate to but how much more so for a man who was deemed in the sight of God as perfect and upright, a righteous man who shunned evil. Now this righteous man is out of nowhere being afflicted with these painful tests, trials, a, a loss. This loss is tormenting him. He's being humiliated for all to see. He, he's falling. From a lofty place of wealth and power, he's falling from a place uh, uh, where everybody looked up to him. Now they're watching him fall. They're watching him fall. And they begin to judge him. But they're watching. They're watching him fall. And so Job gets so afflicted that boils are all over his body. His body is, is, is under attack. And so he sat picking his boils. He sat in humiliation. A man who was once honored, a man who, who, who was once looked up to, a man who was once more a blessed in material good goods than any other man. Now he's he's brought low. All of a sudden he's brought low, and so suddenly now, after his health has become afflicted, after he's lost all his wealth, and now he's he's in a physical peril. And, and he needs uh, attention. He needs, he needs nurturing back to health uh, uh, because it looks like Job is about to die uh, uh, with this affliction. All of a sudden, oh my God. Well, you know, the book starts out talking about Job having these seven sons and these three daughters, but it, it doesn't mention his wife until deep in the throes of Job's affliction, now his wife speaks. And she speaks 10 words. She says, does thou remain in thine integrity? Curse God and die. Now, wait a minute. A righteous man who has made exceptional provision for this woman who has borne him seven sons and three children, but he has afforded her the benefit of his labor. Well, it's not a coincidence that when we talk about Job, we're also saying job. Hello, somebody. A good man has to understand his job. And our job as men, our job as men is to tie our shoes up and do 
what we should do to use our gifts, our talent, our intelligence, our strength, our abilities, and know our job on the planet, identify our job on the planet, and make provision for our women and our children. And Job is a great example of that. But after all that he did for the woman in the throes of deep affliction and what looks like being on the door of death, the only thing the scripture records her saying is asking Job, poking Job and saying, dost thou remain in thy integrity, Job? Curse God and die. Whoa, what kind of spirit is that? That this woman you've cared for, you've provided for, and if Job had the highest prestige of any man of his day in that part of the world, then what kind of prestige and honor did that afford his wife? And so in the 10th verse, Job rebukes his wife. And the Bible puts it like this, that he said unto her, thou speakest as a foolish woman speaketh. What shall we, rec shall we receive good at the hand of God and not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. In other words, Job is telling her, look, woman, you sound like a fool that you would ask me to curse God and die. Am I supposed to only rejoice when God blesses me, when he amplifies me, when he multiplies me? If I can understand that that is the blessing of God, then if I am truly a righteous person, if I am truly a believer in almighty God, and I know that God is the supreme ruler of it all, then God has his own mysterious way of shrinking that which he has amplified, that which he has multiplied, he can diminish. And if he does so in me or on me or with me, then I cannot count myself as righteous if I curse God for trying me, for testing me. I can't curse God. Now, some feminist scholars or Feminist-oriented scholars, I will say, are trying to say that there's a different way of interpreting what the wife said, and they point out the fact that in Hebrew, this word curse is a word, uh, barak, barak. And in Hebrew, sometimes that word is used, uh, um, um, not to mean cursing, but blessing. And so some scholars try to argue that we shouldn't be hard on Job's wife because maybe we're misinterpreting what she said. Well, I think that's disingenuous because the verse 9 where she speaks to Job these 10 words and tells him to curse God and die if she was trying to say, bless God and accept that you may die, then why would Job respond to her with a rebuke? He replied to her and told her, woman, you're speaking as one of the foolish women speaketh. And he tells her, we can't accept the blessings and not the trials, the challenges, the tribulation from Almighty God. So if she was not speaking out of turn, then Job would not have spoken in a way to put her in her place. So now, right after this, Job's uh, friends begin to kick him while he's down. Have you ever been kicked by your friends when you're down? H have you ever <laughs> thought you had some people that 
were your friends that were with you. But when you went through something, either you couldn't find them, find them, or you began to discover that, uh, you know, they were throwing stones at you while you were falling. They were throwing stones at you while you were under tribulation. They were prejudging you while you were under tribulation. So Job had friends like that. This man Eliphaz, Bildad, and so far, these three uh, people into the story, the narrative that we're given about this righteous man, Job's. Job's friends treat him so bad, so long, that at one point he offers his wife as a payment if he has been guilty of violating his neighbor's wife in any, any type of way. His friends treat him uh, with such uh, contempt under trial that at one point God gets very angry with them. So I want to pause right here because a lot of us surround ourselves with incongenial company. A lot of us, we are so needful of the validation, the embrace the acknowledgement of others that we don't have the, 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 the spiritual development, the emotional development to stand on our own even when our so-called friends turn away from us, won't fight for us, won't speak for us, but speak against us. What about your friends? And Job's friends were allegedly men who believed in God, who followed the law of God, because as they spoke in the narrative of, of, to Job, they chided Job that he must have done something to anger God, that God would allow him to suffer all of this loss, all of this trial, all of this tribulation, all of this separation and alienation from the people that he loves. God, Job, you must be wrong. There's something you did that 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 you you seem to be locked out or separated from your loved ones. You seem to be uh, uh, at a loss. You seem to be losing that which you once had. His his friends. Over and over and over again, they, they misjudged Job. They misjudged Job. They treat Job so bad. They misunderstand him so deeply that at one point, God himself speaks up to Job. And uh, he tells Job, uh, I, I, you know, I need you to understand, Joe, that uh, your, your friends, I've been listening. I, I've been listening to their conversation with you. I, I've been, uh, I, I've been uh, stealing an ear, if you will, uh, uh, on this back and forth that's going on with you and your friends. And so around the 42nd chapter, uh, it, it says that God tells Job word, these words, therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant Job. He's talking, pardon me, to the friends and offer up yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly in that you have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. Think over that now. God intervenes while his friends are misjudging him, misunderstanding him, castigating him, condemning him while he's down. They've seen all that he's lost, but there's very little 
empathy from his so-called friends. Even after Job asked them to leave me alone, why are you tormenting me with your words? They would not leave Job alone. They continue to beat him down in their sense of righteousness. So God starts to speak to them and, and, it, and it goes on to say, you know, that Eliphaz the Timonite and Bildad the Shuite and Zophar the Namathite went and did according to, as the Lord commanded them, the Lord also accepted Job's prayer. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had had before. Think over that. Now, he's asking Job, as we would say as Christians, to turn the other cheek. He's asking Job to bear the stripes and the strikes, not only that God has allowed Satan to yoke upon him, he allows Satan to use his friends against him. He allows Satan to use his wife against him. He allows Satan to, to take his children, take his wealth, take his prestige, his honor, take his status and turn the remaining people that he loved against him. Oh, what a trial. Have you ever experienced this type of trial? Have you ever been in a October in your life where there's a transition taking place, where you're being afflicted by cold winds? where the cold winds begin to ramp up, they begin to build up, they begin to churn up. And so now all of the fruit that you've produced on your tree of effort and labor and gift and talent, now the fruit is falling, the leaves are falling, and now you're under trial and affliction. Can you relate to Job? But in the midst of all of that, I remember Job, Job's wife, she spoke up or he spoke up about her to show you that she was not there in the midst of his trial. Uh, 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 Job says, my breath is strange to my wife. And though I entreat for my children's sake of mine own body, my children ain't even calling. They're not even responding to me. Yea, young children despise me. I arose and they spake against me. All my inward friends abhorred me and they whom I loved turned against me. Whoa, wait a minute now. And how do you turn against a righteous man? How do you turn against a God-fearing man? How do you turn against a man who is suffering unjustly? There is no cause for his suffering, but the turn of life, the challenge, the test of God has placed a burden on that man to try that man, to test that man, but you walk away. You turn against him. Hmm. How many of us have been the friends who turned on a righteous man? How many of us have been the friends who kicked a man while he was down? How many of us have been the friends who have been duplicitous and two-faced and snakish and we were with the man as long as he had power, as long as he had prestige, as long as he afforded us a benefit from the fruit of his labor, we were with him. But when God allowed a child to come, we start easing away from that man. Think over these things. Job's friends, ha, they turned on him. They were there with him, probably praising him and celebrating him as long as he was so-called on top. But now that Satan, with the permission of God, 
in accord with the permissive will of God. He's trying, in fact, not only the permissive will of God, the active will of God, because God put the challenge before Satan to try his man, Job. God wanted, he issued the challenge and he accepted the conditions. So not only did he permit Satan to try Job, he actively wanted the trial, the tribulation to take place. Hmm, think over that. Is it possible that your pain, your suffering, your torment, the betrayal you feel, the loss you take, is it possible that a good and righteous and perfect God has ordained your loss not to test the value of your goods, but to test the value of your good, to test the value of your character. And so many of us become bitter at God when we lose. And many of us are angry at God because he took my mama, he took my daddy, he took my auntie, he took my son, he took my daughter, he took my wife, he took my husband, he took the one that I love, he took the stuff that I worked so hard to accomplish in life to provide for my family and God didn't step in and stop them from taking all that I had. And we get angry at God because we have had Teachers of God who don't understand God themselves. We have listened to voices in the pulpit who is as phony and shallow as a $6 bill. We, many of us, have not applied what we've been taught of good, what we have been taught of the knowledge of God. It's been entertainment for us. So here's Job under trial. And we see a picture of a woman who, who is only there twice in all of this story. She tells him to curse God and die. Woo! I think she's a woman who had, you know, Nas has this uh, thing he calls King's disease, the rapper Nas. He says King's disease is, is when you're successful and you're wealthy and, and, and you start to live what we call, quote unquote, high on the hog. You, you start to have this rich life. Everything you do is, is, just, is just luxurious. And so this, this king's disease makes you fat. It makes you sloppy. It makes you lazy. It makes you arrogant. It, 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 you start to fail to work on yourself. And so I think Job's wife had queen's disease. And there's a lot of women that have queen's disease. Because we, as a society, we value uh, uh, sexuality uh, uh, over saintliness. We, we, we value women who are sexually, physically powerful, but we don't value women who strive for virtue with all of what they may have that makes them beautiful or appealing to a man. We don't value virtue. And so we bred a quality of people who have a high sense of arrogance and self-righteousness and conceitedness and entitledness even so even when you 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 provide for them you you buy the woman a Benz but she wanted a Porsche and so she's mad because she has to drive a Benz and she wanted to to drive a Porsche you bought you bought a Versace Ha, but she wanted Gucci. And now she's mad that she got to wear Versace and she came wear Gucci. She got Queen's disease. You had a job paying you good money and for some reason, huh, the strangest thing of all happened that a black man lost his job unfairly and unexpectedly. Now your value is reduced to her. 
She don't know what to do with you because you don't have the same amount of income coming in. She don't know what to do for you. She got queen's disease. Job's wife had such a disease that she had a mind, a heart, and a spirit to speak out of her mouth to tell him to curse God. Think over that. You know, think over that. Some of us are like that. That if somebody challenges our character, we don't, uh, with, with, with the words of God, we, we, we curse God. Don't quote no scripture to me. Don't tell me what the pastor, the minister, the preacher said. I don't want to hear none of that because I want what I want. That is a person, a woman with king or queen's disease. Think over it. And so I want to bring this to a conclusion. As I studied Job, the story of Job, I saw a pattern. I saw a pattern of 10. And this pattern is throughout the scripture uh, in different uh, uh, ways. But this pattern that I saw, particularly to Job, is this number 10. And I think this 10 uh, gives us some insight into the value of Job's story. So if you look at the scripture, 10 is 10 generations from Adam to Noah. Noah is the story of the flood. And after the flood, pardon me, Noah is given a new commandment from God. So there's a complete going out of a world and a coming in of the world, 10 generations from Adam and Noah. 10 generations from Noah comes Abraham. And Abraham represents another global shift where Abraham is considered the father of the faithful. He's considered the father of all three dominant uh, Judeo-Christian religions from uh, the Hebrew faith, Christianity, and Islam. Ten generations later, uh, we have another dramatic shift. There are ten plagues on Egypt and ten commandments given to Moses after the, the uh, playing out of these plagues. Ten. Judaism uh, has 10 sifrat, what are called the sifrat, or the divine powers that are given to man from Almighty God in the creation. The New Testament gives us 10 parables of God's kingdom in the book of Matthew, and the book of John gives us the 10 I am statements attributed to Jesus, Job itself, if you line up the books of the Bible, Old and New Testament, um, Job is the 28th book, but that two and that eight is another 10. So Job starts with seven sons and three daughters. That's 10 children. Job is said to have 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camel. That's a 10. Job is said to have 500 oxen, 500 she asses. That's a 10. Job's wife speaks 10 words. In the 10th verse, Job rebukes her, and then his trial began. 10. There's a pattern of 10 in Job. That Number 10 represents one, followed by a zero. Well, God is the one, and we are the zeros. But that number 10 also represents a number of completion. After you have gone through different uh, uh, trials, different seasons, uh, different uh, manifestations of your character, when you get to 10, there is a, a, a period or a level of completion. So God puts a pattern of 10 
in the story of Job. The one is God Almighty who makes man from nothing into a living being in his physical image and then makes him endure intense trial to make him in his mental and his spiritual image. Ten. Job has a pattern of ten. See, Job was already called a perfect and upright one that feared God and shunned evil, but God used Job to teach us how far we might have to go to demonstrate our faith, how deep we might have to be tried to manifest the best image of God that we can produce as an individual. We might have to suffer loss after loss after loss. But what would be our attitude if we keep the faith, if we don't speak against God, if we don't let bitterness into our heart, even though God is doing some strange stuff to us. He's putting us through some trials and tribulations that we really don't even deserve, but he's permitting it anyway. We've got to understand what the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said to us, that undeserved suffering is redemptive. And so in the end, Job was redeemed and he was restored with a double portion. Hello, somebody. Don't you want a double portion? The book says he was given another wife. His first wife, whose name was uh, uh, Uzat, was replaced by his second wife, who was Dina. And Dina gave Job Hill another seven sons and another three daughters. There goes that ten coming back. But it also says that Job had, was restored with 14,000 sheep, 6,000 uh, 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 6, camels. There's another 20. And that 20 is two tens. Job received a double portion. Job is the model for the suffering of a good man who suffers to make provisions for his family. Job suffered for 48 years, according to the scholars. He was misunderstood. He was kicked. He was spat upon. He was rejected. He was chastened by his friends and his loved ones for 48 years. God allowed Satan to afflict this man for 48 years. Think over that. And you don't want to suffer for a few months or a few years to hold your family together. You don't want to suffer a few months or a few years when God presents somebody who will challenge you. You don't want to suffer with the challenge so that you might grow. Huh. Job's wife, however, is the model for an ungrateful wife whose faith is tested and broken when her lifestyle is disrupted. Now, wait a minute. I know some of you don't like that, but I, I'm, I'm going to speak the truth as God shows it to me in his word. Job's wife is the model of an ungrateful wife. Hmm. Job is also a model of the Messiah who is a suffering servant of God, who, who comes, he knows he's got to save and redeem an ungrateful people who start to feel entitled. His, you know, his Job's wife is, is the model of the intimate disciples of the Messiah who stay close because of a benefit they received from their relationship to Job. They had comfort, they had wealth, they had shelter, they had status, they had protection. And so Job's wife is like the companions of the Messiah who grow fat and lazy and they misunderstand Job. They, they, they think they understand him, but they misunderstand him. And so they begin to abuse Job and they don't know that they're incurring the wrath and the anger of God. The, the Messiah, part of his work is to show man his job. Think over that. To make man Job by showing him his job. He shows man how to master what 
Judaism calls the ten divine powers and use those powers to break Satan's power over God's people and become well a well-made image of Almighty God and usher in the dawn of God's righteous kingdom. And so as I conclude, that didn't happen 2,000 years ago. That work, I believe, is happening today. And so we need to understand the mysteries of God because they can be understood. We need to understand, because I had a teacher who helped me to understand them or have some understanding. I have a teacher who can help us all understand the work of the Messiah, the presence of the Messiah, the effect of the Messiah on the world. And so we cannot just praise Jesus, we've got to look for Jesus because he is present in the world today. And we've just got to readjust our vision and our sight so we can understand the presence of God and his Messiah among black people in America and why God is afflicting America with plague after plague after plague. Be of good cheer, black people. Be of good cheer, righteous people. That yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You will lead me beside still waters in the midst of my enemies. You will prepare a table for me and allow goodness and righteousness to follow me all the days of my life that I may not fall into the mind and the heart and the spirit of Job's, Job's wife. Let's be like Job. Let's let God use us and let's understand that we don't have to look back for Jesus. We've got to be current in today's events to see, to hear, and to know that Jesus is present. I thank you for listening to this message and I pray that Almighty God will bless you whatever your faith tradition is, to come closer to the truth that stands at the door today. I pray that he will allow you to strengthen yourself by taking the time to hear what we have to say. And I, as a student and protege, of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan greets you with the greetings of peace. Peace be unto you. Shalom Aleichem. Awesome.